All right. Um, let me set a timer here. Okay. So yeah, thank you, thank you so much for the for the invitation to speak and and uh, for keeping us connected while we are all sitting isolatedly in our living rooms. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here and, and talk and talk matrix with you all. Um, I think one, one thing I'm realizing, I, I don't know how, what's your usual thing that you do with the chat, but I cannot see the chat for some reason. So if there's any questions that people have that I, or comments that, uh, eh, that I can answer, feel free to interrupt me, please, and, and, and let me know, okay? Um, so, so yeah, so, so my plan is to tell you a little bit about the Lagrangian combinatorics of matrix. And uh, you might see that I changed the, the name of my talk, uh, but didn't change the content very much. So, uh, so I had called this the geometry of matrix. Um, and, uh, and the idea was basically that there's, there's several new developments in matrix theory that are very much at the center of, of uh, the interplay between, between matrix and algebraic geometry. And, uh, and everything that I will talk about today is kind of taking place uh, in the middle of that. Um, but, uh, but I think a lot of what I'm going to say can be approached very combinatorially. And so, and so uh, I want to assure you that if, if, if algebraic geometry is not your specialty, which it very much is not my specialty, uh, then, my, then there are still things here that, that, uh, that hopefully will be interesting to you. And, uh, and that even if you only care about the combinatorics, you can, you can understand. And, and, uh, and I also have questions for people who love matroids uh, coming out of this project. So everything that I will talk about today is joint work with uh, Graham Denham from the University of Western Ontario and uh, Juni Ho of the Institute of Advanced Studies in Princeton. Um, can you see my mouse when I move it? Okay, great. Okay, so let's get started. So let me let me begin by telling you uh, what are the goals of this project. So I would say that there is a a combinatorial goal. and a geometric goal. So first I'll tell you about the combinatorial goal. And the combinatorial goal is to prove some conjectural inequalities about matrix. Um, so to our matroid, we have this sequence of numbers called the H vector. Um, and uh, and the, the main combinatorial goal of what I want to talk to you about today is, is, is uh, how, just tell you a little bit of an indication of how we were able to prove uh, the conjecture that uh, the H vector of a matroid is log concave. Okay, so that's a very concrete combinatorial goal. And then I should say though that, that this was uh, there's another goal that is at least equally important to us, if not more important, um, which is to uh, study the Lagrangian geometry of matrix. Okay. And uh, so these are the two main goals of the project. Uh, and I, I might have a chance to say a little bit about what I mean by, by 1B, but that's not, that's not really my goal today. My, my goal today is to talk about the first goal and just tell you the combinatorial side of the story. Um, but, but I do want to at least make sure that, that uh, to tell you that, that there is a, a geometric side of the story that uh, but I, I find interesting and uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about this, I gave a talk, to, a talk about this in a conference called Arrangements at Home. 
uh, on May 15th. And so there's a video of this on the internet if you want to look it up. Um, and I'm also going to be giving a talk in the seminar of the Fellowship of the Ring, uh, which is the seminar of uh, algebraic geometry and commutative algebra at Berkeley on July 30th. So if you're interested in, in more of the geometric side of things, then, then I can, I will be saying more about that then, okay? Um, but like I said, my goal today is really to talk about the, the combinatorial side. So let me tell you about that. So, okay. So, combinatorial goal is to uh, prove the following theorem. Um, and uh, as I said, this is all joint work with Grant Denham and Jun Ho. That uh, the H vector of the broken circuit complex of the matrix. I'll say what I mean by this. Is um, unimodal. So that means that the numbers go up until some point, then they peak, and then they start going down. Uh, lock concave. Um, and this means that their logarithms form a lock concave sequence. Um, and flawless. And this means that the first numbers are, are smaller than the last ones. Okay, so the first one is less than the n minus first one and so on. The ith one from the left is less than or equal to the ith one from the right. Okay. Um, and uh, maybe, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll mention that it's not, it's not hard to see that lock concavity implies unimodality. Um, and it's also true uh, that if you're able to prove this, this uh, statement for unimodality, then you're able, then that implies the statement for flawlessness. And this is a result of Martina Junkakovitsky and Ding, Ding Le, okay? Uh, and so really the key result here is this, um, lock on cave inequality, okay? Um, and uh, let me just mention that that these things were conjectured by uh, Zilowski in 82, and Dawson in 83, Chibi in 89, and Schwartz Okay, so uh, so this is the main goal. Um, this is uh, the main combinatorial theorem of our paper, and and so let me let me just make sure that that we're on the same page as far as what this actually means. So uh, okay, this is this is the statement. So what is this uh, H vector that I'm talking about here? So. Um, maybe what I'll say is that the um, H vector is the sequence of coefficients of the characteristic polynomial of the matroid evaluated at Q plus one divided by Q plus one. If you uh, if you like graphs more than you like matroid, then you should be just be thinking that uh, 
that this is the chromatic polynomial of the graph. And then you just divide it. So you evaluate a Q plus one and you divide by Q plus one, okay? And uh, this is called the Shalin polynomial, the reliability polynomial. There are, there are reasons to, to study this, but I think just, I wanna make it very concrete and say this is, this is what that sequence is. Um, I will say that if you like the top polynomial, then these are also the coefficients of the top polynomial evaluated at Q comma zero, okay? And um, so I actually wanna do a quick example just so that we can make sure that everybody's on the same page about what we're talking about here. So, so here's a graph, okay? And, uh, okay. And so I, I want to compute this polynomial. And so what I do is that I say, okay, what is the, the, the chromatic polynomial in this case? This is the number of proper Q colorings of the graph of the vertices. And, when, and proper means that if I have two neighbor vertices, then they should have different colors. That's what I mean for a Q color, for, for a proper Q coloring. And Q is my number of colors, okay? And so the way that we usually do this is that we say, okay, uh, let's, let's, uh, let's start coloring one vertex at a time. And so if I look at uh, this vertex there in the middle, there are Q colors that I can use for it. Now, if I look at this vertex up here, then I can use any color except for the one that I just used. So that's Q minus one colors. Now I go over here and I say, okay, the color that I use here has to be different from these two. So that's Q minus two colors. It's important to notice that these two are neighbors and so those actually are actually different colors. So there really are two colors that I'm subtracting here. Um, okay, now let, let's go to this vertex. So, so there's two colors that I need to avoid. So I have Q minus two here, okay. And then I come over here and I say, okay, how many colors can I use here? I have to avoid these three colors. But now the trouble is that I, I don't know if these three colors are different from each other or not, right? Because the, these two are different. These two are different, but I don't know if, if the two corners are the same or different colors. So I actually have to split it into two cases. Um, and so let me, let me split it into two cases. So, and go over here. So one case is, okay, let me, let me just make, so, so the first case is when uh, these two colors are different from each other, okay? And the second, the second case is when these two are the same color, okay? So, in the first case, um, I have to actually reevaluate my computation because I, I see, okay, I started with two colors here, Q minus one here, Q minus two here. But now if I want to ensure that this color is not the red color, then I actually have one fewer option. And so this Q minus two becomes a Q minus three. Okay, so this is Q minus three. Whereas in this case, if I am forced to use the same color that I used over here, then I have no, no choice. I actually only have one, one choice here. So let me raise this Q minus two and put a one here. So I, I took these Q minus two cases and I separated it into Q minus three cases where I didn't use the color red and one where I did use the color red, okay? Um, and then I say, okay, well, in, in this first case, these three colors are not different from each other. And so the number of possibilities here is Q minus three. Okay, whereas in this case, the number of colors that I have to avoid is the one in the middle and the one shared by these two. So there's actually Q minus two possibilities. Is there a question or? I thought I heard somebody. Um, okay, so, so then in this case, my number of possibilities 
is q times q minus one times q minus two times q minus three q uh, squared. And in this case, the number of possibilities is q times q minus one times q minus two squared. And so this is this is uh, the chromatic polynomial of the graph. And if I evaluate it at q plus one and divide by q plus one, it's an easy computation to see that the h vector is one, four, six, three. Okay. So that's the sequence. Um, and and so what what the what the theorem says is that no matter what graph I start with, if I do all this computation and I compute the h, h vector, then the these numbers satisfy these inequalities. Okay. And furthermore, this is not just for graphs, this is for matroids. And so if you know what a matroid is, which, uh, or at least you like, you would like to know what a matroid is because you're sitting here today. Well, for, for a matroid, there is a, uh, a way of defining this polynomial. It's, it's, it's a different way, but uh, you can define this uh, characteristic polynomial for any matroid and do this computation and you get some H vector. Okay, and the theorem is that no matter what matroid you use, you get a lock on case. Okay, so, this is uh, the yeah. This is the first uh, the main goal. Let me make one comment, which is that uh, you might be familiar with the work of uh, Adi Prasito, Ho, and Katz, where they prove the analogous theorem for the f vector of a matroid. So we're proving it for the h vector. They proved it for the f vector, and and one thing that I would like to point out is that there's a general theorem that if your if your h vector if you have an h vector that is log concave, then the f vector is strongly log concave. So that there's there's a strengthening of the condition of being log concave. Uh, so in particular, this this result implies the the Adipasito Hawkatz result, and so we we know I mean we to some extent rely on on their work, but we also know we're going to have to work harder than they did because this result is strong. Okay. So this is. Uh, the main theorem. And so I would like to just give you an indication of, of what are some of the tools that, that go into it. Okay. So I don't know if there's any questions uh, while I go to the next page about what this theorem says. Okay. So the second part of my talk will be to tell you what are some of the combinatorial tools, okay? Um, and uh, and here what I, what I would like to do is, is, I'm just going to give you some definitions of some objects associated to matrix that we encountered that have beautiful properties and that our impression is that they deserve to be better studied uh, By people who love matrix theory, matrix theory like you. Okay, so let me let me draw a parallel here because there's there's a well there's a world of sets. And there's the world of matrix. Okay, um, and uh, so for my running example, I'm going to use the set of numbers from zero to seven. And for the matroid, let me let me just pull the matroid from um, from the previous example. So, um, that's going to be my running example of my matrix, okay? Um, I'm going to use the, the graphical matrix of the square pyramid. Okay. 
Okay, um, so let's let's uh, make start with some definitions that you are all familiar with, and then go to more interesting definitions. So the first definition is that of a subset. Okay, so we know what a subset of a set is, and so an example of a subset is going to be the subset zero one four. Okay, um, and. Uh, Just to make things a little bit easier to read, I'm going to be dropping uh, all the brackets, okay? So the, the analogous object is going to be a flat in a matrix. And so a flat is, is a set such that if C is a circuit and little c is an element of the circuit, if your flat contains all but one element of the, of the circuit, then it has to contain all the elements of the circuit, okay? So, for example, if I look at 0, 1, 4, I see, okay, well, 0, 1, 4 contains most of the cycle 0, 3, 4, right? So, if I, if I have a flat that contains 0, 1, 4, then because it contains 0, 1, 4, it also has to contain 3. And if it contains zero and one, then it also has to contain five. So the flat that I'm showing there is the smallest flat containing zero, one, four, okay? Um, so those are the flats of my matrix. And um, so let me give you, okay, so then now let, let's talk about a flag of subsets um, is going to be a, just an increasing sequence of sets. So I might start with the set one, and then zero, one, four, and then zero, one, three, four, seven. Okay. And uh, in the matroid, the analogous thing is going to be a flag of flats, okay? Um, and so that's going to be the same thing. But now I have to only use flats. So for example, uh, I could, uh, have the biggest one be zero, one, three, four, five, and then, for example, zero, one, five is a flat, and for example, one is a flat. Okay, and so that's an example of a flag of flats, um, and it's going to be convenient to always add the empty set and the full set, but but really the interesting part is this one right here. Okay. Um, okay, so this is very classical. Um, and this, in some sense, comes from the classical tropical geometry of matrices. And so now what I would like to tell you is, what are the combinatorial objects that come from, La from the Lagrangian geometry of matrices? Okay. So this is, uh, this is the first series, and now this is the second series of things. And so the first thing, which has nothing to do with matrices, is what we call a bisubset. Okay. And a bisubset consists of two sets, S and T, and they have the property that their union is everything. Um, and there's, there's three forbidden triples. So it's not E with the empty set. It's not, sorry, this is another notation I'm using. You're not allowed to use this, you're not allowed to use this, and you're not allowed to use this. So they're, they're basically the, the, the non-trivial ways of expressing E as a union of two sets, okay? And so an example would be if I want 0, 1, 4 to be part of a bisubset, then I better make sure that the union is everything. So I have to add all of the elements that I'm missing, and then I can add more if I want. 
So for example, I'm going to add uh, zero. Okay, I'm allowed to do that. So that is a, a by subset. Okay. And so now the analogous thing for matrix is going to be called a by flat. Okay. And this is the first new combinatorial gadget that we introduce. And uh, I would love if people think about this and see what they can discover about by flats. Um, a by flat is a, a by subset such that F is a flat and G is a coflat. So in other words, it's a flat of the dual matroid. Okay. And so to do an example, I need the dual matroid. So um, let me bring it over. Uh, so here's my dual matroid. And I guess actually just to keep things in place, let me let me move the the first matroid over. So this is my main matroid, and then I'm going to put the dual matroid next to it. Okay, um, and uh, maybe I'll just I'll just focus the story on on graphs for today. But this is a construction that works for it, for any matroid. But for graphs, uh, for planar graphs, I should say, uh, what I'm doing is just constructing the, the dual graph here. So, so here was my graph G from my, from my primal matroid. And so to construct the dual graph, I just put a, a, I just put a vertex inside each region, including the outside region. And then I, con I, I joined two of them whenever they're joined by an edge, whenever they're separated by an edge. So, so for example, this and this are joined by an edge four, okay? And I won't do this on top because it's going to be very messy, but um, I just ask you to trust me, or you can do it yourselves, that the dual matrix is given by this by the same graph, but with a different labeling. Um, okay. And so, and so the, the kind of building block here, this notion of a biflat is asking, how can you express the whole set as a union of a flat in the first matroid and the flat in the dual matroid, okay? So for example, let's try to build a biflat that starts with, so maybe I'll, I'll start using the same colors so that it's um, easy to trace things. So I start with zero, one, three, four, five, which is, a flat of the first matroid, and now I need a flat of the second matroid, uh, such that the union is everything. So at the very least, I need to include two, six, and seven, right? So that the union is everything. And I could stop there. This is this is a uh, a by flat because it so happens, and this doesn't always happen, but in this case it happens that two, six, seven is a flat of the dual matroid. Okay. And so that is a perfectly valid by flat. But if I want, I can, I can add more things. And so just to, to make the example a little bit more interesting, I'm going to also add um, three and four, okay? And two, three, four, six, seven is also a, a flat of the dual matrix, okay? And so this is my first definition and again, yeah, Nice research problem, I think. Uh, whatever part of matrix theory you live in, uh, try to see how this interacts with the notion of biflats. I, I think I think this might give some interesting um, directions. Okay. So that is the notion of a biflat. And then the final definition that I wish to make, which exists in the realm of sets and in the realm of matrix, is. Um, the kind of by analog here, by flag of by subsets. Okay, it's starting to get a little bit messy, so maybe I'll, I'll separate this over here. 
Okay, so what is a by flag of by, set, by subsets? Uh, well, as the name indicates, what you're going to start with a bunch of by subsets. Uh, now they should be they should be in a kind of a flag relationship. That's why this is called a by flag. And so what that means is that S1 is contained in S2 and so on, which is contained in SK. Um, and the T's should also be a flag, but in the opposite order. Which it makes it makes a little bit of intuitive sense because S and T are supposed to be the union is everything. So if S1 is small, you need T1 to be big. And if SK is big, you need TK to be small. So that, that gives you a little bit of an intuition of why they should go in opposite directions. Um, and then there's there's one last condition, which is uh, that SI union T I plus one is not E or um, so that's a bit of a technical condition, um, but it turns out to be what is needed. Okay. Um, and so uh, let's do an example of a by flag of by subsets. So maybe I'll start with my flag of subsets that I had up here. Um, one containing zero, one, four containing zero, one, three, four, seven. Okay. Uh, and uh, since I already built a by flat uh, with, uh, sorry, a by subset with zero, one, four, let me put zero, two, three, five, six, seven. So, so the idea is that the, um, what I put right here is the same as what I put right here. Okay, this is, I'm putting this by subset uh, as this entry. And so to complete my by flag, I need something here and I need something here. Okay. Um, and they can be anything such that, so for example, right here, I need to put something whose union with one is everything. And so I'm just going to use the whole set. And uh, right here, I need something whose union with zero, one, three, four, seven is everything. And so um, I'm going to put maybe um, two, I should at least put two, five, and six, and I can put more things. I'm also going to add seven. Okay. So that is a by flag of by subsets. Okay. And the geometry tells us that this should be an, an interesting notion. And um, so that's again nothing to do with matrix. This is this is just about sets. But now if I move to the world of matrix, then I'm going to have an analogous notion, which maybe you can already guess what it is. And so a by flag of by flats is what is what it sounds like. It's it's a by flag where each one of the components is a by flat. Okay. And so maybe I will do an example carefully about for this. So for example, I can um, I can start with my I can start with this but with this by flat. Okay. Now Let's, for example, go in this direction. So let's say that I want to put the whole set here. Okay. And then here I can put any subset like that is a flat. So for example, I'm going to put 0, 1, 5, which is a flat of my, of my matrix. Okay. Now I could also put um, 0. But then I have to put something over here. And it should be, you can see that the, the only flat of the dual matrix whose union with zero is everything is the whole set. Okay. Now I can go more, I can go in this direction, for example, 
I can add something over here, like 267. So let's see, what do I need to add? So 267 is a, is a flat of the dual matroid. And if I want a, a flat in the, in the primal matroid, so it says the units everything, I should at least include 0, 1, 3, 4, and 5, okay? Um, and in fact, this is a by, this is a flat, a flat. And so actually what I, what I have written down here is a by flag of by flats, okay? And one thing that I would like you to notice that didn't happen over here is that here, the inclusions are strict, but here the inclusions are not strict. And so you're actually allowed to repeat sets. What you're not allowed to repeat is pairs. So if, if I repeat this set equal to this set, then I should not make this one equal to this one because those would be the same by flats, okay? But you are allowed repetitions. Um, and again, it is useful to say, to put E here, to put the empty set here, to put the empty set here, to put E here. Um, and, but the interesting part of course is this part, okay? Um, and so if, uh, I guess the, the, the main combinatorial thing that I, that I would like to do is, it's an invitation to think about these objects. And I, 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 will, I will say why, why we find them interesting. Uh, and our impression is that this, this, which is the central object of this project, it probably has nice combinatorial properties that should be further studied, okay? Uh, I have it, a question. Um, it looks like the, the by flag of by flats that you wrote there um, doesn't satisfy the last property. The SI union TI plus one does not equal E unless I'm missing something. Thank you. I, I like that you're paying close attention. So let's, so let's test this condition. So, so the, the first ones are increasing, that's clear. The second ones are decreasing, that's clear. Now let's check this last condition. This last condition says that uh, this union, this, that, that one, of the, one of the following unions should not be everything. This, this union, this, this union, this, this union, this, and Alex is pointing out actually it never happens. Those unions are always E. And this is, act, this is actually why we add the things at the beginning and the end, and the end because it's actually this union, this, that is not, that is not E. Okay? And so part of, the, part of the definition is to include this, these two trivial things, and then this condition might be satisfied here or here. Okay? So it's satisfied in a bit of a strange way. Okay. All right. So uh, this is, like I said, the main combinatorial object. Um, let me give you a, let me give you an exercise in case you're interested in thinking about this. So here's the exercise. Um, we know that every maximal. flag of flats has how many flats? Well, you, if you take any maximal flag of flats, you can always put one flat in each rank. And we're kind of ignoring the trivial ranks at the bottom and at the top. So uh, this is not the exercise that, or maybe this is an exercise. If you're not used to thinking about flats, this is, this is a nice thing to prove. Every maximal flag of flats has size r minus one. Um, now, the by version of this is that every maximal by flag of by flats has size n, let me just erase this. Um, it has size n minus two, okay? Um, this is not a tremendously difficult exercise, but it's not a trivial statement. And, and, if, you, and if you prove this, I think you'll begin to see how do, you, how do you begin playing with these things, okay? So, okay, these are the combinatorial tools. And uh, I guess I said this, but let me write it down. Research problem. I'm, I'm sorry if this is a stupid question. Um, isn't the last pair, E and the empty set, uh, not a by subset because it's forbidden? 
Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, it's a bit of a silly thing, but but uh, the reason that I put a box around here is because these things are not allowed to be. These are not by flat, by flats. This is not a by flat. This is not a by flat. Uh, the by flats are only the ones in the middle. But if but when you go to check the condition of being a by flag, part of the condition is you you add this at the beginning, you add this at the beginning, and then you check the condition. Okay. Okay. So thanks. That's, that's, thanks. Um, Okay, the research problems study the combinatorics of, of these objects. And, and again, you can decide what that means to you depending on what part of matrix theory you're interested in. Um, so this is, this is the uh, part of combinatorial tools, okay? Uh, are there any questions about, any further questions about this before I move on? Is N the rank of the matrix? I should have said N is the number of elements. Um, so, for example, in this case, n is eight, and so the maximal biplex should have size six. So you should be able to add two more in here. I didn't because they wouldn't fit in that square, but but the maximal ones should have uh, length six. Okay. Okay. So let me. Um, The third part is going to be on algebraic tools. Okay, so this is going to work like this. Um, let me get the correct definition here. So I'm going to define a ring. which for geometric reasons is called the conormal chow ring, but, but you don't need to know what any of these words mean in order to understand the definition. The conormal chow ring of a matroid is the following ring. So we start with a polynomial ring where we have a variable for each by flat. Okay, so for every single by flat, we have a variable. Um, and then we introduce some uh, relations. And the relations are. of two kinds. So the first relation is that if you multiply a bunch of variables where these are distinct, Okay, so, so if you take a bunch of different biplaces and you multiply them, um, and if they do not form a biplat, then when you multiply them, you're going to get zero. Okay, so so when you multiply by flats that are different, that's going to be zero unless the, the, the set of by flats form a by flag. Okay. So that should say by flag, Federico? Yeah, I just want to understand yeah. what you say in the condition. Yeah, sorry. That this should be a by flag. Uh, and so. I don't, I don't like the, the term. 
annihilator, which people usually use. I think that's such a violent word. But basically, only by flags survive. Okay. Um, so that's the first kind of relation. And then the second kind of relation looks like this. Um, alpha I minus alpha J and alpha perp I minus alpha perp J for I is different from J where uh, where when I write alpha I, I mean the sum of the variables where F is in I and it's not the whole set. Okay, so it's a it's a sum, it's a sum of all the by flags where the first term contains I. Okay. And then the uh, alpha prime is, is just the, the dual thing. So This is the analogous thing, but now instead of F, I have G. Okay, so it, it takes a little while to, to parse this, but, but what this basically says is I have a bunch of equations that say this X plus this X plus this X plus this X equals this X plus this X plus this X plus this X. Plus X. Okay, and so when you have a big expression in this ring, if you happen to see the sum of the first things of X's, then you can replace it by the second ones. Yeah? If you, if you happen to see all of these terms, then you can replace them with all of these terms, okay? But I think you will see that this is, this is a little bit, it's not so easy to work with, and in particular, there's a lot of terms here, so this is not so clear how you're supposed to do this, okay? Um, okay, this is the normal chowering of a matrix, okay? Uh, if you're interested in the geometric origin of this, ask me in, this, in the question and answer session, but, but for now, this is just going to be a combinatorial ring. And let me just tell you some facts about this ring. Some facts that are not obvious, but that we prove. Uh, this ring is graded of the degree a n minus 2. And why should, why should it be degree n minus two? The intuition is that basically, how do you make something of degree n, n minus two? Well, you have to multiply n minus two things. And so the biggest that can be is just the longest that a by flag can be. And we said the, bi the longest by flags have length n minus two, which is why the biggest this can be is n minus two. And at that point, things become zero. Okay, so even though in principle, this could be, this, this could be graded in, in infinitely many dimensions, it actually has only degree n minus two. Uh, and then, Good. It's clear from the definitions. I mean, if you're used to this kind of thing, then the constants, the things of degree zero are just constant polynomials, right? So they're just constants. Uh, the thing that is not trivial is that the top degree is also constants. Okay. This is a manifestation of point carrier duality, which says that actually AI is isomorphic to AN minus I. But we don't care about that. We only care about the, the, the last term which is that the last numbers are constants. And so what that means is that if you look at a, a polynomial of degree n minus two here, then that's just a number, okay? You can just think of it as a number, okay? Um, and uh, this isomorphism is, anyway, maybe I won't say that. So let me make another definition. We said that this was alpha i. Let me make another, let me define um, something that will look similar, which is delta i, which is going to be the sum of um, all the by flats where a both f and g contain i. Okay. So alpha takes the terms where F contains I, 
alpha perp takes the ones where g contains i, and delta picks up the ones where both of them contain i. Okay. And again, if, if you would like to play with this a little bit, um, let me give you some, okay, first, let me give you a non-exercise, which is that alpha i is equal to alpha j for any i and j. Now, why is that? Well, that's, that's because that's the relation that I introduced in this ring, okay? You can always take alpha i out, put alpha j in. That's, that should not be surprising. Uh, the thing that is, less clear is that delta i is also equal to delta j, okay? And uh, again, this is not a terribly difficult exercise, but it's not trivial, and I think if you play with it, it'll, it'll help you understand how this ring works, okay? Um, but so that means that I have a well-defined class called alpha and a well-defined class called delta, okay? And so let me share with you our main kind of algebraic combinatorial theorem, which says the following. It says, what happens if you multiply alpha to the k delta to the n minus two minus k? Okay, well, let's think about that for a second. Uh, this has degree k, this has degree n minus two minus k, and so this is this is a term of degree n minus two. Okay, so, so this lives in the top uh, degree of the showering, and so it's just a number. I can I can just as, I can identify with the number by this map. Uh, this has a morphism which is canonical. Okay. So this is just a number, and then the question is, what is that number? And that number is going to be precisely the h number of the matrix. Okay. So this is the kth number in the h vector of the matrix. Okay. So uh, what this means is that, remember, these are the numbers that we're trying to prove are lock concave. These were the numbers that came from our characteristic polynomial, one, four, six, three. And what we're saying is that these numbers can be given this algebraic interpretation as inside this ring, okay? Um, and, uh, if you if you have a similar taste to me, this is just fun. I, I think this is this is a fun computation. You know there must be some nice matrix theory happening if you're getting those numbers, and so you have to learn how to compute in this ring and do something to to make this work. Um, but the kind of punchline here is that this is we don't just do this for fun. We do this because now. Uh, through combinatorial Hodge theory, um, and what I mean is that we have to we have to prove that this conormal showering has the has the right Hodge theoretic properties, uh, and because of that, we get the theorem that this sequence is lock on. Okay, so it's not just a, I mean, this, this is a fun algebraic combinatorial statement, but, uh, but the reason that we want to do it is, is because it is the kind of statement that allows us to prove lock on cap. Okay. Um, and uh, if you are familiar with a little bit of the relevant algebraic geometry, uh, you might know that things that look like this, uh, there are tools in algebraic geometry to prove that things that look like this are lock on cave. There's something like the Alexander Fenchel inequalities, uh, there are several other tools that look like this. And so basically, we take our combinatorial numbers, we interpret them algebraically, and then through a combinatorial version of algebraic geometry, we get that the, that the numbers are lock on key. Okay? Um, so this is, this is a very rough idea of how this works. Okay? Um, and I think Maybe, okay, so you told me that I could go as long as I want. I'm not gonna go for long, I'm not gonna go for three hours. Um, but I do wanna say a little bit more about just how, how do you go about proving something like this? Because I think, especially if, if, 
if you're interested in, in the combinatorics of matrix, then this is actually the statement that might be the most interesting. And so maybe I will continue for a few more minutes, not many more minutes, five or 10 minutes, but if you have to go, then, then please don't be shy and go. And I won't even know, so I, I cannot see you. Uh, so let me just give you a, an indication of how this, how this kind of thing, how do we prove something like this? So how does, how do I take this theorem? Um, how do we prove something like this? So, we we have we have at least two proofs of this of this statement um, so the the first proof um, is uh, is geometric okay and I, I mentioned this because if, if you look at our paper, the proof that you will find is proof number one. It's a, it's a geometric proof. And, um, and maybe I'll just, I'll just say, uh, what should I say here? Uh, maybe I'll just say that we have to do some, some nice algebraic combinatorics to prove a statement, which I, I will just write down. Um, So we, we have kind of a refinement here where instead of using alpha to the k, we actually take uh, these, these monomials of a certain form, we multiply them by this, and we get something which we call the beta invariant of a flag. Or in flag f of m. So, so what this means is for, for any flag of flats, you can make a lot of it in a natural way, and you can basically fix its its degree when you when you multiply it by this thing, um, and you get a bunch of beta invariants, which are these nice combinatorial numbers that matrix theorists like. Okay, um, and then we connect with uh, this work of on uh, Chern, Schwartz, McPherson classes. Of matroids. So this is this is uh, coming from tropical geometry. Um, so these CSM classes are are basically like this analog of churn classes for varieties that are not smooth. Uh, and uh, and in a beautiful paper uh, that is very combinatorial and that I encourage you to look at. There's a there's a completely combinatorial theory of what is the matroid analog of these churn schwarz McPherson classes, um, and this is kind of coming from conormal geometry. But but uh, but there's a lot of beautiful combinatorics here, and we rely that on, on these results in tropical intersection theory and, and prove this. Okay. Um, and that's and that's I mean, because like I said, this is the proof that you will find in the paper that we have on the archive. Uh, but we have a second proof, and this is not yet published, uh, but it's pretty much written, so you should see it on the archive soon, which is combinatorial. Um, and, and it basically says, okay, well, how do, you, how do you even begin to compute something like this? You, you're, you have this complicated ring with complicated relations. How do you, how do you compute? Um, and then, in particular, one, one challenge here is that when you're trying to compute alpha to the k, delta to the n minus two minus k, there is something which is a which is great and not great. It's it's a feature and a bug at the same time. Okay. So the the nice thing is that when you when you want to compute using alpha, 
you can use many definitions of alpha. You can use alpha one, you can use alpha two, you can use alpha n. So, so whenever you see an alpha, you can substitute it by any of these n things, the one that you prefer. And similarly, delta has n different expressions that you can use. And so when I write this statement, you can plug in for alpha and delta any of these things. So that's very handy and it's very useful in our proof, but it's also kind of a mess because then you have to be clever about how do you do this in a way that you can control the computation. And, and that's the key is just how do, you, how do you use that advantage but control it with some structure. And so this is where you, you we don't use Grobner bases, but if you use Grobner bases, this will remind you, it's, it's, it's kind of like Grobner-like. Computations. Okay. Um, and, uh, but then the way that governor bases always start is you have to choose an order on your terms and then you do governor bases. And so for matroids, what does that mean? What that means is you have to choose an order on the matroid. Um, which it's natural to choose the, maybe the alphabetical order, but you can choose any order of the matrix and then you do the computations. And if you've worked with matrix that have a ground set that's ordered, there's a very powerful theory, uh, which is the theory of, of basis activities. And so the nice thing is that when we, when we do these kind of governor like computations, we order the matrix and then what ends up happening is that we just run into a lot of basis activities, okay? Um, and so let, let me just show you one example of, of what this looks like for, so what I did is that I actually went ahead of time and computed um, one term, which I will show you. So this is the computation for the matroids that I had earlier. So let me let me bring them down. Where do they go? I'm gonna take these matroids. So these are my matrix, okay? And so I told you that this has degree n minus two, right? n minus two is six. And so, and let me remind you that we computed the H factor for this. And we saw that it was one, four, six, three, okay? And so what I'm trying to show you in this example is the computation of this three uh, through the conormal chow ring, okay? And so, and so what I have to do according to this, to our theorem, is that I have to just compute delta to the six. And if I want the answer to be three, it turns out that what I need to do is write delta to the six as a sum of three terms. And each one of these three terms is given by a bifac, okay? Um, and so this is the computation. Now, how do we get to this? This is, this is uh, where, I have to be honest, I thought this was not gonna be hard, but it turned out to be tremendously hard, at least for me. And, uh, and the proof is like 30 pages of basis activities. Uh, and maybe one reason that I want to explain to you how hard this is, is that delta, delta to the six looks very, very tame. It only has three terms. But um, if I were to compute delta cubed, We did compute the delta cubed, um, and we found that it has a 586 terms. Okay, so so I I, I say that to, to help you understand that delta is complicated, delta squared is more complicated, delta cubed is more complicated, delta to the fourth is more complicated. And so delta to the five is less complicated, delta to the six is even less complicated, and it's actually 
very simple and we can understand it. But the irony is that we actually don't understand the lower powers, but we only understand the power that we need to understand, delta to the six, okay? And, and just to give you an indication of what is the combinatorics behind of this, okay? Um, let me just underline some terms here. So six, five, and four. Uh, am I underlining here? Um, I underlined the biggest term Then, no, I under the smallest term that is missing from it from the ones before. So, so the smallest is seven, the next smallest is six, and then out of these, the smallest is four. Okay. And so, if I look at what I underlined here, here I underlined four, five, and six, here I underlined four, five, and seven, and here I underlined four, six, and seven. And if I add a zero to all of them, then these things are what are called the beta NBC basis. Okay, so this is something introduced by Krapo, studied by Ziegler and Bjorner and others. Um, there is something called the beta NBC basis. They're defined very combinatorially. Um, if you are used to activities, these are the bases that have internal activity one and external activity zero. And so what we're able to show is that the expression for delta to the six or delta to the top power, the terms are exactly in bijection with the beta NBC basis. And uh, it is a theorem of Krapo that the number of those is the beta invariant, which is the number that I need it to be, okay? Um, and so this is how we do it for, for the three, and then you have to kind of do a similar computation for the others. Um, then a little bit of the combinatorics that is at play, okay? Um, I was hoping to say a tiny bit about what are the geometric tools, but I think I should stop here. I don't want to run any longer. And like I said, I'm, I'm going to give a, another talk on the more geometric side of things in a couple of weeks, so you're very welcome to come to that. But I think that's a good place to stop, so thank you very much. Thank you, Federico. Uh, let me okay, bye. Uh, are there any questions? So I realize that I just found the, the chat, so if you write questions on the chat, I'm happy to answer them, or comments, or feedback, or anything. Um, I'll get us started. Uh, the Hodge theoretic tools, is there any chance of making them combinatorial in a way similar to what you just alluded to for the um, the algebraic lemma? Okay, so what, so uh, yeah, let me think about what, what to say and what not to say about <laughs> the Hodge theoretic tools because there is a lot to say there, but um, maybe, um, Okay, let me, let me say something, which is that if you have a polyhedral fan, okay, so a bunch of, a bunch of, a, a bunch of a polyhedra glued together at their edges, um, then there's something called the chowering of the fan, okay? Um, And so one thing that's at play is that there are two fans associated to a matroid, one called Bergman fan, one called the conormal fan. And, uh, and the, the conormal chow ring is what happens when you, when you put the conormal fan here, okay? So this is a chow ring, uh, so it's, it's some ring, and um, If uh, if 
if sigma is nice, then this has some properties, um, which is point carrier duality, that, that the i degree is isomorphic to the n minus i degree. You have hard left sheds, which gives you an, an explicit isomorphism between those two. And you have these Hodge Riemann relations, mm -hmm. which says that some bilinear form has a certain uh, sign signature. And it is this Hodge Riemann that allows you to prove lock on cap. And this is what people talk about when they talk about the Hodge theory of these things. And so the key question here is, is what is what is nice here? Okay, and, and so uh, one word that some people use and that we use is that the fan is left shifts. Okay, um, and there's some definition, but the big question in combinatorial Hodge theory, I would say is which fans are left shifts. Okay. Um, and this seems to be an extremely difficult question. So for example, we, we know that all complete fans are left shifts. So if they cover the whole space and they're rational, they're left shifts. We, we give a proof of this in our, in our paper. I mean, this is, the, this is an old result of McMullen and we give a new proof. Um, so complete fans. This is due to McMullen. Uh, the Bergman fans that uh, Carly Clivens and I introduced of a matroid, uh, these are left shits, and this is the main result in the, the main geometric result in the Adiposito Hopcott's paper of, of 2020. And what we prove is that conormal fans. Uh, have this property, okay? Um, so this is just to give a little bit of, of like, you know, wh what am I saying when I, when I talk about there's some combinatorial Hodge theory here? What I mean is this statement that that this conormal fan, which I didn't describe to you, but I basically described to you. The conormal fan is a, is a nice fan you make out of phi flags. This is left shifts. Um, and our proof is very much not combinatorial. Uh, and uh, it's hard to hope for a combinatorial proof because there's actually very few other examples of fans that are left shits. And so it's, it's not even clear like, at what level of generality should you, prove, should you be proving something like this. Matrix have this property. And I, I, I think it's fair to say that nobody really fully understands why matrix happen to have this property that, you know, most fans just don't have this property. And it's, and it's very exceptional that, that to have this property. And one of the very nice surprises is that matrix have this property. And, I should say that's one of the reasons that all of a sudden a lot of algebraic geometers want to learn matrix theory because it's a very rare property. And, and um, but yeah, our, our proof is not very combinatorial. I mean, there are some combinatorial ingredients, but we actually have to just develop combinatorial Hodge theory further and and, uh, and the matrix come in. But but uh, yeah, at the moment I have little combinatorial hope that we can a little hope that we can kind of make that theory combinatorial. I would love to see that, but I, I don't. I don't know how how you would do that. Um, are there any other questions? Okay. Well, then I'll stop the recording and.